Good evening, everyone. I'm Daryl D'Souza, founder of Earthkeepers Connect and convener of the New Earth Summit. The host for this evening, the 24th day of the pre-summit webinars leading to the New Earth Summit in November. This is the second edition of India's first integrative summit on solutions to our problems in health, food, farming, and environment. I extend a warm welcome to our panelists of this evening and also on behalf of our 10 Earthkeeper groups in India and overseas. And we express our gratitude to you for taking out your time to be from your busy schedules to be with us and share your wisdom so that all watching this webinar and its recording also later may understand the importance of rainwater harvesting. That's our topic for today, effective rainwater harvesting system. So I will start uh, with introducing our panelists to the audience. Abhinav Apte, a mechanical engineer, MBA and certified energy auditor. Abhinav has 13 years of industrial experience out of which more than five years are in the field of environment. As a general manager of Leela Environmental Solutions, his vision is for the organization to become a leader in sustainable solutions with a core focus on water. Like Leela is a company based in Panjim, offers solutions in rainwater harvesting, uh, sewage and effluent treatment system, efficient plumbing solutions, and micro irrigation, that is drip and sprinkler system. The company has executed key projects in these areas, both for the government and corporate clients of India. Captain Joseph Lobo, a master marina by profession and managing director of a shipping company, from a point onward developed interest in good governance issues and he joined Agni as a trustee. On shifting to Goa, he involved himself in treating sewage and garbage. As the manager of Green Goa Works, Joseph managed Sonsodo garbage site for one year under contract to Goa Foundation. Compost was produced and sold to farmers since. Quitting Green Goa Works and starting on his own, Joseph exclusively dealt with sewage and water body rehabilitation. He executed a project in Saint Inez Creek, financed by CIPLA CSR and promoted by chairman of GSPCB and Panjim MLA Siddharth Kulkonikar. Captain Joseph Lobo has 80 sewage treatment projects that deals with 1.2 million liters of sewage every day and whose process is painted in by GOI. Romaine San Francisco, holds a master's degree in public administration. A 15 year stint as projects coordinator of Center for Herpetology, pioneer in conservation, research and ecological studies in mainland India and the Andaman Nicoba Archipelago, providing solid grounding in environmental issues. As project head of Samarpan Foundation, Chennai, she conceptualized an outdoor laboratory of learning through applied sustainable practices, raising forest nurseries, mangroves, organic farming, mosquito eradication, rainwater harvesting, and waste management. She's a chairperson of Environment, Goa Chapter, ALL, All Ladies League, has received awards for Rose of Rizwan, achievement in the field environment, an exceptional women of excellence 2018 from the Women's Economic Forum. So here is a question for the panelists. First question is getting the basics into the topic. Why is rainwater harvesting so vitally important right now? and also this new normal that we're seeing. So I would like to start with uh, Romain. Could you please share with us why is rainwater harvesting so important? 
for all of us in fact to do it's not just an you know industrial application or something that corporates get into it for every home isn't that so romain that's true uh, it's the need of the hour i would say for every individual on this planet our very existence depends on it whether it's your home whether it's your office uh, wherever you are whether it's your food you're going to be needing that precious uh, water which we are neglecting to do to save on our war footing and the very uh, uh, reason for this kind of a webinar is to reinforce the view that we have to take some very very urgent steps um well last year there was a prediction that 2020s were going to be running out of water in 2020 in india and um, i think new delhi and bangalore were at top of the list but the pandemic came in between and uh, god knows where we are at this level with the amount of washing of our hands and whatever else we we have to purify ourselves to protect ourselves against this um, the covid so now all the more reason once things wane or whenever it happens we've got to really work on this <laughs> saving this rainwater as we know groundwater is depleting faster than we can ever replenish it and uh, salinity is overtaking us in all the coastal cities and I hate to say this but goa will be in a very vulnerable position should this happen and uh, in in increase as it is doing now and overtaking our fresh water resources here with our rivers uh, in jeopardy at this point and goa depends on its water uh, rain water uh, every year and its rivers is a very big question as to what's the future of goa and i'm addressing everybody here who is from goa and who's going to be at the receiving end of this disaster if should it should it strike us let's be prepared and uh, well all the panelists here and I'm, i'm grateful to interact with all of them and have interacted with all of them the, the last summit in and darrell um well we are all here and there are many many more like us who are not on this platform that are doing exceptional work and we all just have to get together and make it happen let's see that uh, goa is saved it's a very small state with very big problems encased in a lot of other problems that uh, bringing disaster to the state in many ways to use the uh, caption that was coined in south india in the palni hills some of you know the catchment for chennai are in the palni hills and uh, a beautiful phrase was captured the wealth of the the health of the hills is the wealth of the plains so if we don't have our hills we are going to have nothing in terms of food food or whatever else we planning on the plains so we better protect the plains and the hills the plains and everything around us and all our rivers and lakes and whatever fresh water bodies we could save to prevent sea water intrusion there are options there are solutions for it and one of the main things is rainwater harvesting which will create a reverse osmosis around the uh, in the ground so the more we do this in various ways it's going to work it has to work and uh, i'm there to to give you my bit in a short while but there are options so let's not be too devastated with the news of what's ahead of us provided we are ready to attempt to correct it yeah thank you thank you uh, romain for those perspectives and just in case our audience didn't pick up some of that word i'm going to uh, detail a little bit what you shared with us last year uh, and what romain was just sharing with us that the ingress of the sea water into the land so what happens is that you have you know two water bodies one is your ground water and one is the sea level so what's happening is that suppose the sea level was here for quite some time and with our ground water depleting and the wells going you know lower and lower it reaches a point where the ground water becomes a little low like this and then wherever the sea is touching in the you know the kazan area and all of that the sea water starts coming into this ingress into the land so you have the fresh water that has been maintained by like she said by 
if you have uh, the hills that are full of trees and you know they are getting good rainfall so that's called the catchment area if you have the hills and that forest uh, thing being cut off then the amount of the rainfall in a place goes down so the supply of water into the plains and then into our rivers and then to our homes it lessens then the second thing is what are we doing and wasting you know how much of water and then the water table goes further and you have a point where the water table of the land can start dipping lower lower and lower and become lower than the sea level then from under the land you have the sea coming and getting into your farming area then soon you know your farming area that's close to the sea there's all salt water in it and you cannot do farming so that's uh, isn't that right uh, uh, romain that's absolutely absolutely right yeah and the only way that we can save this uh, thing is by conserving water and not wasting so much of it uh, and uh, the second thing is of course rainwater harvesting so we'll get into that topic uh, abina uh, would you please share with us uh, some more aspects or angles of uh, you know yeah. conserving water and the need for rainwater harvesting yeah so um, for rainwater harvesting i would you know uh, one of the key reasons why we should do rainwater harvesting is you no know, uh, the the purification is free the transport is free the pumping is free the distribution is free and it is poured on top of your rooftop after all this without any charges to you if you compare it with your water supply which you get at your home and if you can imagine how much of uh, no um, time energy and cost and everything goes into effort goes into purification transport pumping distribution and no the maintenance of the entire thing here for a rainwater harvesting there is no maintenance as well so it it comes every year without any maintenance you, you, it gets poured on your rooftop and no uh, so that that is one aspect of it second aspect of it is you no know, uh, as you have mentioned about this uh, uh, sea water getting into uh, into the you no know, uh, ground water there is another aspect which uh, which is important is is the flooding so if rain water is not uh, uh, it does it is does not enter the ground you know because of the paved and the concreted uh, floors of your buildings of the roads etc it it doesn't find itself in, you know ingressing into the ground it flows across uh, the streets and you no know, it causes a lot of flooding so you no know, that that is another reason why you no know, rainwater harvesting should be done in addition to harvesting also the groundwater recharge has to be done so that's that's what i want to say yes thank you abhinav uh, and that's the typical scenario that all of our you know metro cities are going under the principal reason why mumbai is also getting flooded you know year after year so i view that as a completely you know um, ecological you know disaster for all these cities where everything is being concreted and you know tarred and there's absolutely no space for the water to get seep into the ground so it goes into all the sewers and then the sewers are pumping out the water and then in mumbai when you have the high tide coming in that water can't flow in so that sewer water comes back to you along with the uh, sea water and you have the entire city flooded so so that's anyway we know by the design of our cities itself that they are designing a disaster system they have designed the cities to get flooded it's not like a natural catastrophe and all rains have been happening but overpopulation of city concrete jungles are the disaster we have created uh captain lobo could you share your uh, angles yeah first and foremost let me tell you that in the old days there was no rain harvesting nobody ever, nobody ever thought about it okay water like you said uh, abina was free and available all over and uh, the main things that kept the uh, water table high was number one usage of wells everybody had a well in his house everybody used well water and when you use well water what happens you start the cycle of recycling automatically what happens in those days was that there was a lot of forest cover a lot of vegetation now with vegetation rain does not uh, is not allowed to beat onto the ground not allowed to beat onto the ground and to the soil 
because this rain beating on the soil lifts up the clay and puts an impervious layer on the soil. Once that happens, there is no way that rain can then penetrate the soil. Even now in monsoon, if you go in the center of a, a field and dig one meter, you will find dry soil on it. While you go under a tree in the peak of summer, you will find the soil damp. So the first thing we must understand is that rainwater harvesting is a concept because of various reasons. But one of the reasons is deforestation. The second is that people have stopped using their wells because as you say, pipeline water coming there, nobody wanted to remove it by uh, the old kosher method, et cetera, et cetera. So what happens when you don't use your wells? The springs, the aquifer springs slowly start getting clogged. Now you don't have water coming in from top. These aquifer pipelines of springs, you start getting sediment settling in there. And slowly, slowly, those springs start getting smaller and smaller and choked up. So that is the second point I wanted to make. The third point is that a tree, a tree, First thing it does is puts its tap roots. When it puts its tap root down, it starts breaking the rocks and allowing for water harvesting. That's the first thing that the tree does. The second thing that the, uh, the tree does is put its lateral roots for its feed. And this feed comes from its own leaves. Now what happens when the leaves fall there? It provides a second carpet or cover for rain not to beat on the soil directly. So the first cover is the, uh, the tree canopy, which does not allow the rain to fall directly onto the soil because that is one of the main criteria, the main, uh, uh, what do you call, def, uh, uh, deterrence for rainwater harvesting. The second is because raindrops are not allowing and the leaves fall, it creates a lovely soil cover underneath where a lot of earthworms and bacteria, uh, uh, micro uh, uh, bacterial activity takes place. So this again is another sponge. And this sponge absorbs and keeps the water throughout the year. Now, if you have a rainforest or a, a good forest cover, after some time, the tree will not require that much water. When it does not require that water, it starts releasing it automatically into the ground. So this is the second natural method of uh, of rainwater harvesting. The third point is that Goa or, or India receives three cubic meters of water every monsoon. Three cubic meters of water per square meter means 3,000 liters. 3,000 liters, if you really take in a, in a 100 square meter plot, will give you one lakh liters into three, the three lakh liters. And if you take your water consumption for nine months for a small family, you'll find that there is enough water from a monsoon. If you can harvest at least 80 to 90%, that water is available for the family throughout the year. Today, I have never taken a, a PWD connection. I have my well. But in summer, in summer, when I need to clean up because sediments start coming because the, the inflow from the aquifers start increasing because my le level has gone down, the mud, the sediments also come. So you see here, by doing this in summer, I am also clearing my aquifers. Now, when the sediments come down, this time I said, let me clean the thing because it was causing a problem to, uh, with my, uh, what do you call, aqua guard, et cetera, for my water. In the peak of summer, just at, before monsoon started, I pumped out 48,000 liters from a small well. 48,000 liters. You can imagine how much water was there. And it still did not uh, empty it out. I could not empty it out. So the third thing is that we must restart our wells in Goa. When we restart our wells in Goa, we will start actually activating the underground aquifers and preparing it for the next monsoons. So this is my total, uh, this thing for the. 
thank you to Captain Lobo. And by that, uh, your illustration, you know, what you explained is that those uh, you know, 30,000 liters, or the, uh, sorry, the one lakh liters, uh, as it falls on your land and around, and if it gets into the ground, it finally gets into the ground, into the aquifer, and that is the water that you're picking up all through year from the wells, right? All through the year, you can get it from your wells. So it's a storage and a flow system that you spoke of, right? Yeah, that, that is, that just one more point to be added is that the, the most efficient water harvesting you can do in a, in a place like this is to put that water, terrace water, directly into your well. Because then you are getting it directly into the aquifer. By putting it into the ground, you may have some chance of it going there, some chance of it running off, some chance of finding other listing. So right. the second point is put a small sand filter or a stone listing and let it fall directly into the well. Yeah, I right. it. Okay, so that's that's great. Collecting it, putting it through a sand filter, and then letting it go in your well. That's wonderful. And a point that I want to make also on this is that uh, with the water table going down, it directly hits the farmers. And you have year after year, more and more areas going dry. And when the, uh, the water table goes down, they are not getting... Uh, you know, water in their wells for the last three to four months of their farming season. So they can't grow the last crop. And uh, so that's, uh, you know, uh, a direct impact uh, in any farming state. And uh, the model that we are talking about, the futuristic, you know, model, which is uh, the eco-friendly and the, you know, uh, kind of uh, more of the rural area, because like the points we have just made, the way cities are designed is that they're not allowing, there are many problems with cities, but one of the one that we referred to today was it does not allow the water to get into the land and does not allow the land to hold water. Now, that's the reason why in cities, you have everybody buying water. Now, two problems with that water, the, the water that you get in your pipe, it's chlorine treated. Okay, and all the so bad as well as good microbes that are required for your gut, whether it's, you know, your probiotic uh, bacteria or your vitamin B12 bacteria, you don't get any of that from city water, right? But if you will save your water in the well in Goa, you will get that. So it's directly got to do with daily, uh, you know, health. And so because people in cities don't go that, they have to be on probiotics every day. So that's another problem. And uh, any of our panelists would like to talk about this, the, the, the water table and the farming uh, problem. Because in Punjab now, there's, you know, the, there's no groundwater and they have to mm -hmm. dig bore wells to go to you know, 400 feet. So that's the cost we pay and uh, land goes barren and you know, the whole uh, ecology of the place changes because of these mistakes. Daniel, can I add, add something over here? Yes. Uh, you know, all lakes that are there are, have a, a watershed area around which are usually hilly. Now, what happens to this watershed area or this hilly area is that the surface of this uh, hills have mostly eroded because the lake drops in level and then rises in monsoons. So there is hardly any vegetation in that area. That is number one. Little further, they don't want vegetation because the leaves tend to get into the lake. So usually they keep that place a little clean. But what happens in this is that you get a runoff. When you get a runoff, you get all the soil eroding from the hills and getting into the uh, lake. And thereby the lake slowly starts sedimenting itself and, and reducing the capacity. What I had suggested was that all you need to do is to get one JCP going around the hill and making steps so that water is not allowed to rush down, but just get percolated so that when the hill is percolated, like you mentioned before, the whole hill becomes a water reservoir to be released as and when the lake level goes up. So this was my point, which I wanted to make strongly, because if you see, most lakes are sedimenting because the hills around, the watershed area around is almost barren. Thank you. Can I say something? Uh, I have a farm 
on the Red Hills Lake in Chennai, which is uh, one of the biggest lakes. It used to be the city's reservoir. And just what Captain just explained, it's called the Red Hills Lake. <laughs> and now there are no more Red Hills. They've been flattened into plateaus. And uh, as you can imagine, the lake became useless for you know, uh, covering the, the city's needs. So they had to go for desalination plants and all this crap, I mean, which we don't need. Chennai is full of lakes and, and I happen to be bang on that lake where they don't allow any, uh, anybody to plant. But on one side of the lake, you have the city's garbage plants, uh, garbage piled up in mountains. So the real Red Hills have gone. So this is the kind of things that uh, spoil our water table. Even this, I mean, it's still being used. And you have the Metro department, that's the water uh, guards of the city with that big plant over there with garbage next to it, mountains of garbage. So this is what we are battling in Chennai. So hopefully somebody has come up with uh, trying to plant trees. So I'm giving them trees through another circuit, mm -hmm. you know. So at least I can filter this uh, idiotic uh, whatever system and at least make the change. But what you say is right. If we do not have that, uh, we don't have the hills now, at least let's put the vegetation far away from it, but not garbage. And uh, that's, that's it. That's what I want to say. I mean, I just wanted to second that point. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Rumain. And so once again, reiterating uh, uh, for people that uh, the real mineral water is what falls on the land, gets into the ground, and gets into the water aquifer, and then you can get it in streams or through wells. Okay, that's free mineral water at the point of your living, instead of going and buying mineral water bottles, which actually are not real mineral water anyway, and it's just a water that is treated so that you don't get, you know, uh, uh, any germ infection. So I would go now to the next uh, question of more on the tech, you know, the how and uh, the different system. So the next question for our panelists is, what are the different ways of harvesting rainwater, simple and more elaborate? And what are the systems that you used? Uh, Abhinav? So I'll, I'll just put on my uh, slide uh, so that I can show. Uh... Okay. Yeah, so uh, if you can see this uh, slide, so this is the basic system uh, that is used for um, rainwater harvesting. So uh, a pipe is taken down from a rooftop and uh, there is a first flush system. The first flush system is basically to, um, uh, to drain off any impurities that may be there on the rooftop. Uh, no, just uh, so the first few rains, the first few days of the rains um, are, are just flushed off so that you know, they carry in the, all the dirt that is accumulated on the rooftop. So that is why the flush, first flush system is uh, there. And then after that, um, the water is collected in a, in a tank and then uh, passed on through a media filter, stored uh, in, a, in a storage tank. Uh, then the overflow is, uh, uh, if, if, if there is a lot of overflow of this water, it, it is then re recharged in the system. Uh, and uh, if there is that also overflows, then it is released to the stormwater drain. So first, no, uh, but, um, yeah. No, sorry to interrupt at the first point, right? Yes. Where the yeah. water comes down from the roof. And yes. so the impurities, do they sell, settle down by weight or is there a filter in that first tank? No, no, no. The uh, the impurities are uh, first plus system. It is basically a valve which is uh, reopened of to the tank only after the first few rains. Initially, the the uh, all that goes goes off goes like it is it does not enter the tank. So the impurities do not get into the tank at all. Okay, Abhinav. Yeah. So as uh, as you can see, the first uh, yeah here it is uh, yeah. So if you can see the overflow and the flush out at at, at the HD, HDP tank. So uh, the uh, so I'm sorry. I I think I got a little um, 
confused here. So basically, the downtake pipe is entering the HDP tank, and from there it can flush out uh, at the bottom of the HDP tank, and uh, the overflow goes into the dual media filter and the sump. It, it can be this system. It can also have an alternate system where the valve is opened only after um, the first few rains. So for the first few rains, it all drains off. Okay. Okay. So uh, then the uh, so basically the first uh, system is to have a, a reuse of that water. Second uh, is to recharge that water in the ground. And in case both these systems are uh, utilized to the full, then it is released to the stormwater drain. That is the simple system that we are following. Okay. So the sump uh, storage tank would be the one that holds a lot, like. 10,000 liters or 5,000? Yeah, so that, that depends on how much is the investment capacity of the user. Yeah, investment and how much land or space they have. For and, and the consumption as well. Right. How much, how much is the consumption of, of the particular user at that? So if it is a, like a, a small house, the tank is a very small tank. If it is a factory, it can be a bigger tank. So it depends on what is the usage. Right. And the second... Uh, uh, diagram the recharge shaft yeah so yeah so here is here is where the water is recharging the ground the ground water table okay so in this system you get your storage you get your reservoir and whatever the extra can get into the ground correct and if if the rainfall is so fast i mean it's uh, coming in too fast then it's an overflow as well getting into the yeah, absolutely top. Oh. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Abhinav. Uh, so uh, that's, that's that's the rooftop. And in case there is a storm water drain that you want to you know uh, recharge, like you no know, one is the water is which is falling on your rooftop, and second is the water which is into your uh, on the road on the pavement etc. So uh, when you have your property, one a, one like one is the square meter area of your rooftop. And another is the square meter area of your you know, pavements and roads and this th things like that. So that also, if you, you know, you can um, have a recharge for that as well. So this diagram explains that. No. Okay. So there is a for, so for that you need a desilting chamber because you no know, a lot of dirt and you no know, things like that uh, you have to separate them, and then there is a media filter and then that overflows into a recharge shaft. So this is basically a groundwater recharge system for stormwater drain. Okay. okay. Yeah, so this is the top view of what you just explained, right? Correct. Uh, storage. Right. Yeah. So um, I'll stop sharing and maybe oh. you can... Yeah. So... Captain Lobo, would you like to share with us, uh, uh, maybe in words or some, in a diagram, uh, a simple just, system or the system that you like to follow? I'd al already mentioned that India is blessed with three cubic meters of water for every square meter of land. Okay? That's one. So if you take a 100 square meter house, you get three lakh waters in nine months. Okay, so this is the water that you get in 100 square meters. A family of four consumes, say, 200 meters and to nine. So you, a family of four in nine months consume 2,16,000 liters. So there is a surplus for the year of 84,000 liters. Okay, and that accounts for 28%. So even if you don't harvest... 100% water, but just 25%, you have covered a family's need. So this is basically what I was trying to project in saying that we must start looking at self-sufficiency and working out systems using logic. And this is logic. The second thing is, so, Another, another simple method of putting roof water into the wells, like I had explained last time was, allow the roof water to fall to the ground. 
Now, when you let it fall to the ground, you build a trench in that area where it is falling. You mark it and build a trench of about a half a meter or so. And you fill the trench with small, uh, with stones. Here in Goa, we have lower, that is rubble, uh, laterite rubble. So you fill the trench with rubble. That trench now becomes a pipeline, okay? Which has a, which automatically does the filtration of the water. As it goes closer to the well, you'll find the water quality improving uh, uh, without much intervention. This is a simple method that everybody can adopt and in their own homes. Third is check the lay of the land. This is what I found on my farm in Kandas, you know. I found that when my lay of land was there, but because there was not much vegetation, the water used to flow out and off the land. Then I took a, a, a what do you call it, a, a wow that's saying that I will not allow any of my water to get outside the land. So checking the lay of the land, I use a, a plow and I dug across uh, along the contours. Okay. So to expose the lower layers, that's all I did. I didn't do much. And when the monsoons came, this was the first monsoon. As soon as the start of the monsoon, the soil got a little soft. And when the monsoons came, 95% of that water was absorbed in the land itself and nothing went out. So this is another very simple method for getting action immediately. We also did some other things. The government also helped out here. We constructed mini dams along the river waterways, the rain waterways. Okay. So these mini dams along the, the course of the rainwater that was flowing down the hill, just small mini dams which we took from rocks from the, from the, the waterway itself. And we just piled it in, in, uh, in the uh, runoffs. What happens was the leaves that came with the monsoon acted as a barrier and kept the water stored there. And by doing that, the water started retaining itself in those, uh, what do you call, uh, small streams. And that water became the source of water for the tree cover during the end of the monsoon to summer. And that tree cover in, in increased exponentially. That was another thing we did. Then, so this is uh, some other indications we found. Uh, which I had already mentioned before. In the peak of summer, uh, one meter near the roots is still damp. And in the open fields, in the monsoon, you'll find dry soil. And that's because the rain has made an impervious layer, clay layer on top of the soil. Yeah. So these are the main points that I had put, which are something that is very doable for, by everybody. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Captain Lobo. Can yeah. you stop the screen share? Yeah, one minute. Uh, I have to stop share, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you. So, I'm just elaborating a, a wonderful point, especially for, uh, you know, uh, everybody who has a home uh, below bungalow, a villa or bungalow and all of that. What Captain Lobo was saying that from the roof at the point now, so that means wherever your roof is ending, right? and the rain is falling down. So all across your house, nobody has a square house, but they got one point here, then it's here, 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 maybe a rectangular house or whatever. So uh, Captain Lobo, that means at the edge of wherever rain water falls, that is where you got to do the trend. Right? That's right, that's right. And I think uh, obviously people, because even I was trying to do that for my house and my houses on the land has got a little slope. And I think if people look at the, you know, the corners of their land, they would see some slope somewhere. And then you have probably to decide that, that if, it, if this point is my highest point and this is my lowest point, and I dig this, you know, trench around, the water obviously is going to come here. And then from here, this is the lowest point, and then I can feed it into a well. So people would have to look at that basic, right? Do some a little bit of basic engineering and see how from the highest point it will flow all around the house and come to the lowest point and then you can put it in a well. Is that right? Yeah, that is. You know, the reason why I'm suggesting these low-cost methods is that everybody can 
participate instead of you know waiting for technology etc etc everybody can participate in this with just one small labor a little common sense and you have already made your place water hub a uh, 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 area of water harvest right and this is so much uh, better and more economical than people putting those you know those uh, plastic half cut uh, drp pipes and with the you know the metal thing from the roof and after uh, two years with the rain that thing rusts and your pipe is falling down uh, that's quite a messy system so very good option uh, and plus it looks so nice to see rainwater dripping off your roof no? and you right. get a pound of water <laughs> yes and uh, so another tip for people uh, uh, captain who you can validate this is of course that whether it's half meter or 1 meter uh, your especially at the front of your house you're going to walk across it so you want that a little level so are these uh, you know gray stones what we call construction stones kodi metal metal yeah yeah, yeah. you yeah. can put that on top also it can be pretty smooth right to walk yes, on yes yes and plus it does the filtration also no yes it does the filtration because of the gaps between the stones If awesome. you take uh, stones that are too small, then you don't get gaps. So you better take one that's at least you know size of a thumb. That's right. right. That's yes, uh, Romain, would you like to share with us some simple and uh, uh, more detailed uh, options yeah. of rainwater harvesting? Some some of the simple options is what uh, Captain Lobo mentioned straight from my roof because I believe in using my well. So I'm one of the people here in this village, and most of the people who have uh, wells have not been using them. And I've been advocating the use of wells. And uh, the best way is to recharge your well directly into your well, you know, with uh, with the system that uh, Captain proposes. And uh, yeah, the rooftop method and uh, for groundwater recharge. The reason why uh, we came about. I'm going to go straight into this because of the time factor, you know. and i don't have my presentation but people can uh, go on my on the link and and get the presentation of this blueprint that was presented to the government of chennai uh, this the corporation of chennai which is which was the first for many things it's the first to to get into water scarcity it was the first to introduce rainwater harvesting in domestic uh, uh, homes as a as a mandatory uh, um clause before you got your permissions to build this was a fantastic thing that was introduced in 2001 but despite all this there was still the water shortage with, with all these various methods so there was a need to come up with a more um doable solution that pins the government as well you know because i got a i got a real surprise to know in my interactions with the government of chennai when i was uh, pushing for for a number of projects including rainwater harvesting that they were spending um 10000 crores on the annual expenditure for in for stormwater drains now chennai is a water starved city and it's trying to protect uh, trying to flush out build these stormwater drains to 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 uh, avoid the flooding that used to take place every uh, very often and it waits the whole year for this and then builds this fantastic uh, stormwater drains in every nook and corner and every road of chennai spending this humongous amount of money with, to no for no cause just to flush out the garbage and clear the flood flood waters from the city so the solution that we came up with was who owns the roads is the government the government owns the roads whether it's the local bodies uh, in charge of them or the 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 pwd it all comes under one circuit under the government of that particular state so it was the health officer of chennai that actually spilled the beans and told me hey listen i want my mosquito problem solved so i'll push for this with the other bureaucrats and all the other commissioners and we get this permission so it involved doing these rainwater harvesting trenches or pits across the city's roads and low lying roads so they gave gave us the permission to do the prototype which was in a very low lying area again another lake area where a very high fi community lives and so they didn't want to step out into these flooded areas that it was a lake area which was filled up and made into uh, a, a a locality for bureaucrats and you know top police brass and things like that 
So the first prototype was done across one of those roads to prove that a road could go dry. So what a rainwater harvesting trench across the width of the road transverse is that it would give a higher volume, save a higher volume of water that's flowing away from the road, destroying the road, which, which you know, is a problem, problem for commuters, ending with the um, um, mosquito uh, infestation because of the potholes created with the erosion of the roads and loss of precious rainwater, which they wait the whole year, they built these majestic stormwater drains only to lose it to the sea. So it seemed like a, a cycle that had to be stopped in its tracks. So we, so this was presented in terms of pits that could be used on the cambering, cambering of the roads, the sides of the roads and low line, watch the gradient of erosion and then put them down and across the, the road. So it was done in a five foot, um, five feet uh, method, which is uh, auguring first to find your sandy soil layer uh, adjacent to the road, then sinking a pipe for future use to measure the amount of rainwater saved in one season. And um, cutting, I mean, you have to get the permissions of the PWD naturally, you have to ensure that no electrical wires and no pipelines and everything, so you have all the assisting engineers present on the spot, it has to be quick. The slabs are precast with heavy duty 16 mm steel that can take a 10 ton uh, axle load bearing uh, for vehicles like that. So this is set, set aside and kept ready for the grand day when you bring in a JCB with a four, 400 mm bucket and uh, cut, uh, cut the trench to the sandy soil layer, sink uh, the the foundation for putting the top slabs and the side slabs with sets with lips and filling in the aggre aggregate. So the total process takes about one and a half to two hours. So no disruption to traffic. There'll be a diversion and uh, it worked. And then the water is measured for what is saved on that low lying area. And they had the first dry road after, before the monsoon, this was set. So that first monsoon, they had a dry road and they didn't have to step out into uh, knee deep water that was saved and the level went up. Now this particular one was also used before we did the prototype in Chennai, which was taken up in the Royal Palace of Jaipur, where they didn't have groundwater and uh, water level rose in their wells in the very first few seasons of rain in Rajasthan uh, by four centimeters. So the this proved a point that, you know, if you say, if you did this on a war footing, so years down the road, this was taken up by a recent uh, uh, commissioner. He pulled it out when things were getting crucial and Chennai was getting more and more saline, saline water, you know, ground water was disappearing I and mean, fresh water sources were disappearing and people were scared about their buildings and all this crumbling down, you know, so they, taken it up on a war footing. And just last week I was speaking to somebody and they said, oh, in front of my house, I see these manhole looking structures on my road. And so I said, well, that's, that's a rainwater harvesting pit that they've put on the roads. So that's fantastic. And if we could do this for Goa, which is the reason why I'm on this webinar is imagine what we could do to all that water that just flowing down in Panjim under the sub, uh, underpasses and and just flowing off and we're going to be regretting it if we don't stop it in its tracks and divert it into such rainwater harvesting pits and trenches and of course the most important thing is to push that saline, saline water back with this just by sheer numbers of these uh, pits and trenches and everybody doing their job with this we can push that ingress of um, seawater which is rising and Panjim is going to be at the receiving end and all the islands around Panjim. Uh, that's going to be very, very crucial for all of the people in those kind of areas that the sea is going to be taking over. So that's the most important point. And of course, after a month, I mean, I was shocked. I was just uh, driving through Seoul in the other day. We've had about 71 centimeters of rainfall. This um, this monsoon, everybody's bragging about it in the press and what a lot of rain. But where is that rain? Because I saw water tankers taking 
taking to the roads now. We haven't even finished our rains. What is wrong? What is happening? What is going on here? I can understand Chennai. Okay, we have water trucks all year round. Millions of people with pots and beautifully colored pots roaming around from four o'clock in the morning, fighting tooth and nail for water. And we had the Kaveri issue and we had all of this, but no excuse for Goa sitting here plonk with this wonderful rainfall for four months and it's extending now into God knows if it's going into November, but I bet you know, there's nothing much that's been done. Uh, we're going to be running into another problem now when we suddenly find our rivers going dry. What are we going to do then is the question. Is this, a, is this going to happen? Is this going to wake people up or is it just going to be a political drama that's, that's going on? Let's get real here. It's all about where are we going and let's do what we have to do. Each of us as a community, as a, as a government body, as a local body, I don't know. But it's time to do something about it. And all the methods uh, addressed here, everybody do their bit and we'll be saving that one lakh, uh, you know, cubic uh, liters of water. We don't have to be, we don't have to be having water trucks. Of course, that's a political scene in Chennai. But here, there's no need for that political scene or, or water trucks roaming the roads. And uh, right, uh, Romain, uh, thank you for that. Uh, and uh, to give our audience, you know, a simpler perspective. Now, why why do we need to suddenly do all this rainwater harvesting and put holes in the ground? It is to repair our behavior, what we have been doing for the last 25, 30, 40 years, is that the ground earlier, when we did not have so much of construction, uh, not so much of paper blocks, so much of concrete, so much of roads, Right, the land was taking in all that water, and we did have those high, you know, groundwater levels. So we have come from a history of having enough of water all through the year for our wells and even enough for our farming need. Now, with this commercial kind of development that's happening, basically, we are just uh, closing. We are closing the channel on top of the land in so many places by modern development and you know uh, structures that now that water is not going into the land anymore. So that's the problem. That's the reason, one of the big reasons why the water table is going down. So the only way to correct is start making holes in various places so that the water can find its way again. That's the only way the water table is going to rise. Um, so that, that's why. That's why uh, uh, try and find as much land if you want to, you know, uh, have a local water presence that is there for, you know, for your mineral water or your farming needs, uh, then you have to find these places and trap water. Like uh, Captain Joseph Lobo said, the more amount of greenery and plants that are growing somewhere, they will take some amount of water and, you know, put it in the land for one, two meters, and that can be a water storage. Uh, so my question on this, you know, especially for people who have land and they do have, uh, much more capacity of trapping that rainwater in the ground. So for the people with villas and 200, 300, 500 square meters, and you know, definitely they can do this. But for a typical farmer, right? Have you all implemented or advised or seen anywhere where a farmer has got, you know, about, uh, let's say two acres of land. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, 8,800 square meters. And he does in, the, in, in, in this farm, you know, uh, he's doing farming in the rain. There are limited things that you can grow. But are there farmers who are doing this, that they are growing things, they're putting up soil, and at the side, they allow the water to run. And depending on the slope of the land, they get it to certain positions and they put it in the ground. So maybe they're having two, three location of wells. First of all, it serves that farmer himself, that he's going to have abundant water on his plot for the rest of the farming. And then, of course, it's, uh, you know, charging the water table. So have you all taken up any projects or advised anybody or seen anything happening like this? People with a lot of land and so much of square meters that uh, are they doing some very simple methods like this uh, of, uh, you know, uh, trapping that water in their land? Well, coming to, uh, 
well, coming to what Captain uh, Lobo just said, um, when we first took up these two plots of land where the farm is situated with a project for growing trees, forest nurseries, the first thing that we did was to, to assess the, the, the whole uh, gradient and flow of the water because as I told you, we are, at, we are at the border of the lake and the hills are gone. So obviously, that's the flow of water. We are, we're, in the, we're in the eye of, you know, supposedly in the storm where the water has to come. So the first thing I, we did was do the contours and trap that water within. So we managed to change the quality of the water, which wasn't was affected by a lot of other things happening in the area. And uh, yeah, the last uh, last four or five years, uh, the second plot uh, has has had a very high table because nothing is allowed to get out of the farm, and that's a two acre farm. So that little uh, practical solution that Captain mentioned, which anybody could do, just cut the uh, cut the furrows along the contours of your land and, and keep your water within and find the gradient and then put your, your pits over there if you need to do further groundwater recharge. But your bow well or your wells are definitely going to be high and, and good, good rain water saved. We've been getting a hell of a lot of rain and everybody tells me, how come it's just raining all the time in that particular area? I said, because of the forests that I have on the farm. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the, that's what tree cover does. So, and I'm glad that uh, Captain is an advocate, and all of you are an advocate for advocating trees. Because why don't we let the tree do the job of of holding that water in the ground, remove it, and you can imagine what's going to happen to go sixty thousand trees in the south, sixty thousand in the north. Wonderful. What's left in between? with the highways and, and whatever else, we are going to be in trouble, deep, deep trouble. Yes, Captain Uber. Darren, I, I wanted to make two points, two observations. I mean, one is that societies who have already put drains in their uh, buildings, I mean, the builders have done it. What we did, one experiment was that we got a, a jack, hammer jack, and we punched holes into the drains. So by punching holes into the drains, we automatically made those drains a water harvesting trench. And that started the uh, percolation of water. And we put a few bricks, a few blockages so that the water didn't run up, but it's, it remained there, then overflowed to the next and to the next and to the next. And that way we kept water in the drains and it, there was no mosquitoes because it was flowing water. So that was the thing. But most of that water started going down into the ground and recharging the wells of the society. The second point I want to, to, to put forward is that uh, it slipped my mind. Ah, uh, yes. The wells in Goa. Like I said, people are using PWD water and not using wells. One of the reasons is that because soap pits are going deeper, the wells are getting polluted. But I'm saying if we start using that water, then what happens is we start the flow again and this sewage will then be diluted. And first we start using that water for gardening, then slowly for washing, and then finally go, go further into trying to use it for our drinking. So the first thing I wanted to say was that I gave a proposal to our MLA that if we could tap all the water, if we could tap all the water, from the wells in a automatic system. So this water that is now not being used can then be pumped into an overhead tank, all done automatically and not very expensive. And from that overhead tank, we could then do a small filtration system below, which then flows through gravity. People will have water in their houses for washing for their clothing, for the laundry, and for their garden. And only portable water from the PWD will be for their cooking and drinking. Now, as we go further, as we go over the years, you will find the, water, the well started, starts cleaning itself. And when it starts cleaning itself, then we can start checking that water for its portability. And perhaps most of these wells in villages 
will then start becoming habitable. And what happens when we, when we use this method, we can make that village self-dependent as far as water is concerned. Now, if you take that and magnify it on a larger scale and then put it for other cities, you'll find that well digging wells and not bow wells is one of the best options we can have in ensuring that rainwater gets into the underground aquifers much faster than any other method. Yeah, Doug. Thank you, Thank you. Captain. Yeah. So, so then is it a, you know, a very good standard practice to advise you know, all municipalities uh, in these societies where they have these drain waters because the municipalities also have this problem that you know the waters coming out from all these societies and buildings getting into the main channel and choking it. You know There are leaves and so much uh, kind of other garbage that is cho choking up the drains. So it would be, uh, could be a standard policy that do, across the length of wherever in their society these you know, stormwater drains are going, that they could puncture it and allow some percentage of water or 25% or 30% water just get into the land itself? Or are they, will they be worried about the foundation of the building? No, no, no. the foundation is uh, away from the, I mean, the drains are always away from the foundation. So the foundation is built on a height and the drains are on a lower slope and away from it. It is usually on the other side of the, the society roads, you know, on the periphery of the walls, you know, where the walls are. So that will not affect the foundation. But it, it would sort of reduce the volume of water getting out onto the municipal uh, areas. And because of the roughness, most of the leaves will get stuck there and become biodegradable anyway. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Captain. Yeah. Abhinav, uh, would you like to share any more kind of, you know, problems and solutions, uh, problems that are happening because of uh, certain bad practices and uh, any solutions for them? Yeah, so um, I would uh, like um, I would like to also stress we are uh, now uh, discussing on rainwater harvesting, which is the supply side management. I have no. There are two sides of water management. One is on the supply side, and one is on the demand side. So while we are talking about the supply side as to how much rain we are harvesting or how much lake water or how much well water we are using, uh, I feel there is a lot of scope and a lot of uh, there is a much better return on uh, investment or a, you know, a, a effort to reward ratio is much lesser in a demand side management intervention. When I say demand side management, it means if you are using X liters of water every day, there is a huge scope that you can you know, reduce it by say 15%, 20%, maybe up till 50, 50% also. So when you do that, um, the the demand on uh, the uh, how much you want you are getting supply you no know, all the future um, uh, issues are getting solved like for example if you are using say um, thousand liters every day a family of two or a family of three or four if they are using thousand liters per day if they come down to say mm -hmm. around five hundred liters that much of pumping that much of you know, sewage is less treated that much of uh, no, uh, transport of water is uh, minimized. So, so I was saying the, a lot of focus has to go into um, into demand side interventions as well. And I was talking about flow restrictors or leakage, uh, you know, arresting or overflow, um, uh, preventing overflow of water. You no, know, designing your landscape such that it gets, you know, um, it, it has minimal water requirement. Having uh, irrigation systems which are no, which uh, use much less water because we are irrigating water haphazardly, and the water that is required for that particular tree are giving much more than what is required. So I was talking about this demand side management interventions. That's that's what I wanted to say. Okay. Yes. Very right. Uh, thank you, Abhinav. So I'll go on to the last uh, question uh, to our panelists. Is uh, how can our viewers uh, get in touch with you to know more about your uh, products and your projects? If you have a website or some email address, 
uh, Captain Joseph Lobo's details are already put in the chat box for all the attendees. Uh, so, uh, Romain, could you please uh, uh, share first, and then you could probably type something in the chat box how people can, you know, get some visibility of your work. Um, they can email me at Romain San Francisco. That's uh, R O M A I N E S A N. Yes. F R E N. Yes. C E S. Yes. C O at gmail.com. Oh. Okay. Any website or Facebook page or something? No, I'm just on WhatsApp and uh, oh, uh, connectivity is poor here, so it's mostly on WhatsApp. Oh, okay. I have the same number, my telephone number. Yes, please give your number. Eight nine. Yes. Three double nine. Okay, there was a double nine. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Six seven eight. Yeah, two six seven. Two nine six seven eight. Yeah, two nine six seven. But email is best. Yes. Abhinav. Uh... Are you there? Could you? Yes, Abhinav has uh, put his uh, details there. His, uh, his contact number is there in chat. And uh, Leela Solutions website is also there. Okay, somebody's asking for uh, the link that Romain can give us for the uh, Chennai project. Uh, is there any website uh, that they can go to to see the details of the Chennai project, Romain? It's, it's down on the roads and it's, I think, private. Uh... It was just published and taken up on the road, so I don't know. Maybe they have to contact the Chennai Corporation. For, oh. But they, they're basically using the blueprint that was given to them and executing it through NGOs and uh, uh, developers and people you know, uh, doing a social uh, entrepreneur program. Okay. It's the people. It's not being done by the government. It's the people oh. in the job. But since it's happening to the corporation, they would know about the project and anybody who gets in touch with them. Give the permissions. Yeah. And, uh, I think most of the work is being done by the people, for the people. Yeah, and that's that's what we did. When, when the manual was produced, it was vetted through and uh, then just put into the hands of the nodal organization that, that uh, okays buildings, uh, approves building permissions. And they made it uh, a practice to to get builders to put it into their roads in their layout plans in the very beginning. I think Pune took it up through the Credi. So if somebody contacted Credi and, well, you lose track of it, like who's taking it up. The manual went all over the place, you know. Who wants to do it, just do it. So a, lot, a number of builders took it up and uh, said they were going to be implementing it. But I heard personally, and I saw a newspaper clip that was forwarded to me in Goa, that it's being taken up by a number of NGOs working for cleaning up lakes and uh, executing it through societies and things like that. Ananagar, for instance, has these pits. Um, I don't know the rest of them, wherever, but they handed over the entire list of roads, low-lying roads of Chennai and asked me to take it up. And I said, thank you, now this is yours. You've got to use, mobilize the people with the bucks, mo mobilize the corporates. And this is exactly what Goa should do. Mobilize the people that are using Goa for their business purposes. Get them, maintain those harvesting trenches because it, it's slightly cambered. So. Uh, the water flows in, it's, it's like a mini speed breaker on the road. Basically, that's how it looks, the rainwater harvesting trench. And uh, the pits look like manholes, they're solid covers, so they don't crack. It has to be, quality has to be maintained. And the, the garbage just sits at the, at the end and has to be maintained. If there is plastic and stuff flowing on the roads, you know, so we... We suggested like people like MRF or something sitting on those on those main roads of Chennai and Mount Road and you know uh, College Road and all these hi-fi areas you know Nungambakam High Road to, to get those people we suggested everything the whole methodology of how to go about it so the present commissioner has put it into practice and he's put it in the hands of the public. Oh, that's 
but it's working out because uh, I mean the public are at the receiving end anyway for all these problems. So, well, they continue with their stormwater drains, but at least the rainwater har harvesting is also happening because uh, that, that's an avenue for a very resourceful avenue for bureau bureaucrats and uh, whatever, you know, this uh, doing, doing construction on roadsides and things like that. That was the only criteria when I approached the government was the engineers who came to supervise the site, their only criteria was, will, we, will this stop our stormwater drains? I said, you can make your stormwater drains, but the rainwater harvesting trenches will stop the water going into your drains. And this pleased the health commissioner because then he, he was going to, he said, thank you because now I'm happy. And he gave me all the news of how much they spend, the PWD and the public works department spends on these things. And he said, okay, so now I won't have a vector problem, a vector, a vector diseases here in this area, and all this junk blocking the flow of water, which increases his burden. So actually it was good because all four were sitting in one room and realized how they're all interconnected. For instance, the PWD is now being pinned for the bad roads, but one of the problems for, of course, quality is there, but one of the problems is too much water flowing on the roads. Right. How much did that project cost? It cost, the prototype cost 50,000 in the year 2012. And I contacted the, the contractor who did it and he said, present day cost, it'll be like running feet, uh, 1,500 per running foot of the trenches. But the, the harvesting uh, pits, which is about two, uh, two feet in, in dial, could, could vary with the depth that you have to go to, uh, into, to, to the sandy layer, and the labor costs of the state. According to Tamil Nadu, he said, um, but I don't think we are far off from that. You know, the labor is more or less, but of course, I don't know, go a desk, pay a handsome rate to laborers for this kind of a thing. But the reason why we suggested these rainwater harvesting pits, because they were doing these flyovers, which they're doing right now, you see, so they have this, I know I'm not very technical about all this, but you know, you have these machines that make it so they can just go on punching these things into the road because they had imported all these machines worth crores of rupees and were sitting there idle in Jay Lalita's time, you know, and uh, yeah, just punch it away at night and then put these lids on, precast them and put them on while the, the city is asleep. That's what we told the commissioner. So... But then it's, it's technical because, you know, they don't even know where the sewage lines are going and some of these things, but then flyovers are happening left, right and center. So it was the appropriate time to do this as well. Because yes, you go in a, under a flyover in the peak monsoon and you'll be four feet in water under in this underpass immediately in half an hour's rain. That's how Chennai is and, and that's what... Pa Goa is getting to be. In the next season, you'll probably have the same problem when the underpass in that Panjim crossover of flyovers, you'll have this wonderful river flowing on the road if we don't stop that. Now, all that can be diverted into these pits and disappeared for good in a dry road. It just takes one officer to wake up to, um, I mean, to a good solution. That's all. There's no dirt off his back. I mean, there's, it's just something that's so doable. You can, they can still carry on with whatever else they have to do on the roads, but uh, this, if carefully done, can be implemented maybe in Kalanguta, Kandoli, or some other smaller road, which is what we did. You know, the bigger roads are a little more technical with all this flyover, electricals and whatnot, but uh, even that's possible. At least divert all that water. You go under this flyover, you're scared. You get this bush suddenly, you know, f flowing like a, you know, thunder shower over your car. And uh, imagine this, if this was diverted, imagine this amount of water that's, has anyone measured the water that, that is being lost under those flyovers? That would be a damn good study for a student. It's easy. Just take the breadth of the road, the length of the road into 3,000 uh, 3, cubic meters. And then you must be deputed for this. <laughs> <laughs> you, give me the, you give me the length and the breadth. You give me the length and the breadth and I'll tell you. I know. I love, I love your statistics because I'm a zero at that. Okay. So then I want all these statistics that you said. You know, it's nice to pull out those statistics because nobody spends time on that.
Yeah. Uh, not Spence time, we don't have the noodles for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, 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 you have to do this. Because this is the way, you know, I studied the length and breadth of the Coombe River. I mean, the Buckingham Canal, can you imagine? Right. In, within the city limits, 30 kilometers. And that's how we knew where it was widening and where it was narrowing. And, and we just said that the water dynamics person must work out how much sewage is going into that inflow and outflow. Because that's the cause of the city. That's the seawater channel of the city. Infiltrating the groundwater. So all the wells below the Buckingham Canal are running salty now. Salty, yeah. That's how the mangrove came in. So how, see how they're all linked. So the mangroves, the forest trees to stop that and to create the forest cover and hold that water in the ground and the mangroves to do the rectification jobs. But then they went on making these desalination plants. I tell you, we hope we never get into that for Goa because what havoc it's done to the East Coast, um, uh, the, the coastal region there. It, it's really pulling out the beach. This is, this is a disaster because they put two and they were working on a third when they realized they couldn't control what was happening with the first two. One is in the north and one is in the south. And they were doing a second one in the south. And there was major objections from the people because it was sucking out their, their beaches. It was just sucking out the land and they were losing more and more of this, just sucking out the, the beach. And uh, so you see, that's a danger. If they start saying the Mandovi is now going salty or something like that, the next lofty plan may come up like, let's do something like this. And that'll be disaster. 10,000% or something for, for Goa, you know, Goa will not be able to take that. I have a, I have a friend who lives next to one of these terrible plants and uh, it's disaster. She, she can no longer walk on the beach. It's, it's all these huge pipes going, you know, here and there into sucking out. God knows what it's sucking from the ocean and what it's putting out and what it's pulling out. And no one has a clue. Nobody has a clue. Just because the Arabs did it doesn't mean we can take adopt everything that happens everywhere. Why are we losing our fresh water? Why are we allowing it to happen? That's right. And then and then look for remedies, you know? Yeah, so there's so much of energy and time and money spent uh, when all that we have to do is just rectify some of our natural systems that uh, are actually regenerative in nature, but we have blocked them. Yeah. And no. we are at the start of, I mean, we are at the start of the problems, actually. And I, I, I dread to think, uh, well, because Chennai is, a, you know, is a, what you say, a, it's quite, uh, it's, it's capable of handling these kind of things, you know. But I don't see Goa in that position to handle, to handle something like this, which Kerala and Chennai has handled. Kerala has gone through its sec second time. Andhra is floating now. Cars are floating all over the streets and roads. It's uncontrollable. It's like the floods of Chennai of 2015. That's what's happening in, in Andhra Pradesh. So it's all upside down. Everything's, everything is... Um, but there are solutions which everybody's come talking about on this platform and elsewhere. But it's just uh, political will that has to be. I think we have to storm in and meet a few people. Abhinav, <laughs> you're sitting in Panjim. <laughs> you're sitting in Panjim, right? Yeah, it's the headquarters, right? Yeah, we I'm right now. In... We need to meet these people. We just need to meet them and have a little chat on uh, all of us, no? Wouldn't that be nice? Yes, of course. That would uh, be... No. See, I hammered it out like a rat. And finally, I was so pleased to know that they pulled out that file from the archives and said, hey, there was something, you know, somewhere. Let's pull it out and do this. And that's, what, that's what's happened. But the, the NGOs and the public became very strong about the lakes and everything there. They started cleaning up and there's a guy who's doing, not one guy, but many guys doing, young guys giving up their IT jobs and doing fantastic work of this kind. Of course, I'm sitting here now, but I do get, the feedback and I'm so happy all those lakes getting cleaned and dredged but all the public money 
I mean, uh, private. Uh, private money. People's money. Money. They're quite happy. Government is quite happy. I don't even know who's the chief minister right now. Actually, it's it's that vague. <laughs> you know, it's terribly vague. But the people's power is dominant. But of course, truckers, water trucks goes on as a glorious business in Chennai. That you don't meddle with. You don't meddle with that business. But you can you can stop. We once did a survey many many years ago, and uh, as to how much fresh water was being tapped out of the ECR, and all we did was put put a couple of volunteers. And there was one nice cop, retired cop, who was living on the main road in Nilangare, a place which was last hold of fresh water on the ECR, which is the coastal road. And he just sat outside and he plonked somebody outside and he saw how many millions of gallons were being pumped out of Nilangarai, sweet water table, and they ruined the aquifer there. Now, if you talk to people in Nilangarai, the, the sweet water is finished. It's gone. And, and, and Thiruvan Mayur and Nilangarai are a little higher than the Buckingham Canal, like in 22 above MSL. And all the others like Perangudi and Velicheri and everything is 12. And 0 to 12, 5 to 12, like Koturpuram and the Anna University and the, you know, the, the prime areas, the IIT, you know, you have lovely ponds prop, propping up in the defense area. The fen, defense is, is surrounded by these two uh, saline water bodies, the Buckingham and the Coombe River. And all they were worried about was their, law, their, their golf course, which they were spending a fortune maintaining just to keep the salt water out and keep their grass going. So they called me in to put mangroves um, so that, and then they were ready to pump in fresh water just to maintain the groundwater of the place. I mean, fresh water, because they were losing their lawns, the, you know, the golf course requires, they would kill it and they were spending like, I don't know how much, uh, 300, uh, I don't know, 300, I forget what figure that was after that, but per year on maintenance of the lawns of the defense campus there. Defense, that's the, that's the headquarters, right? The defense. So all I said was put the mangroves around the ponds and, uh, but you're, you dare not pump in water to, to keep your lawns going, your golf course. But they have it. it, it just dies and they just pump in and they just do all this. But they surround it. That's a perfect example of seawater intrusion in Chennai. The Anna University and all these places. Thank you. Thank you, Rumain, for all those insights and warnings uh, of what can happen to Goa if we you know, don't take uh, uh, the right steps. And uh, very rightly, this is a time for, uh, especially you with this experience and some of uh, you know, our uh, concerned people, technical people, uh, people on the panel today and others also in Goa, to kind of you know make a small committee and have a discussion on this and you know kind of go to the authorities and kind of give a warning signal that would that would really be something uh, Only necessary and uh, you know most welcome from, Thank you. most welcome from the public domain people who want to see the problem solved <laughs> but a big committee going to the government I, yeah, of course, uh, I hope in due course of time, they, they look that you are coming to help with the problem and uh, addressing their future problems, uh, you know, uh, in time. Uh, Captain Lobo, any, uh, you know, uh, closing comments on this topic? <laughs> many. <laughs> many, but uh, finally, it requires a participation at the grassroots level. So basically it is trying to get the panchayats. Panchayats are very easily approachable. Yeah. Trying to get them to see that, look, in case there is this problem, we don't want water tankers. We have got solutions in our own villages. Let us start working on them. They are not very expensive solutions. Hmm? And once we start, we'll at least one village will can become an example for the others. Once that mm -hmm. is done, all those wells that our ancestors have built with such uh, a lot of cost and uh, the way they maintained it, uh, we'll be able to start returning the water back into the aquifers. So that I think is the first thing is to approach the people at the panchayat level and they, will, they are willing to listen and they are quite uh, proactive. 
Okay, so with that, they will get a few people from their own wards and we'll say, okay, let's start one well, two well, three well, let's see. And then from there, it becomes yes, an sir. example for others. I think that's the best way to start. I think. Thank you, yes. Yes, some pilots should start and then from, you know, whenever, whichever gets successful, that will be a good success story yeah. to implement in other places. Abhinav, any uh, closing comments? Yeah, my, my closing comment would be uh, on, on the demand side, um, uh, like everybody should learn to fix uh, uh, the leakages perhaps. So, so if you do that, uh, you respect uh, the water that is coming to your house. Uh, if you arrest that, you know what, how much it has traveled and how much of purification and pumping, etc. has gone into it and you, you should not let it drop. Then um, that can be a start, and then you can, uh, of course, do a harvesting. There's no, no, but what is going waste, you can stop, you can start there. Right. Uh, yes, Abhinav. Thank you. Thank you. And so, last uh, uh, word from me to the audience uh, is start thinking and ideating on how you can trap that water that's coming, how do you can keep it in your land, in your space. So that's uh, the starting point for you uh, to know that if you trap it in your space, you're going to have water under the ground. Otherwise, you're going to run out of water. And that's the next uh, crisis that's facing this planet. And I think it's just because of one thing only, the kind of, we have just been closing the surface of the planet with all of our construction work. That, that's the main thing. All our ideas of modern construction are just sealing the surface of the planet and there is no water coming into local zones. So local zones are running out of water and groundwater and all this fresh water is going into the sea, uh, whereas it should have remained in the land uh, for our use. So thank you once again, uh, we'll end here. Thank you, Captain uh, Lobo, uh, Romain, and Abhinav. I wish you all, all the best uh, with your efforts and uh, your ideation and you know uh, uh, your projects. Uh, this is yes one of the, the very important uh, things that need to be, it's not so visible, but we need to sensitize more and more people as a personal responsibility and also citizens, formation of citizens committees to take up this in their local villages, uh, approach the panchayats and together, you know, formulate uh, and, uh, you know, get in touch with our speakers, uh, especially those of you in Goa. All our three speakers today are from Goa. So you have all these wonderful resources here to get in touch with them and start forming some committee and tackle this problem. Thank you and good evening, everyone.